good evening everybody so welcome to uh, pemsa evening uh, case based discussion uh, followed by news uh, today we have a um, uh, well known um, uh, lecturer um, dr vasana kirudena so it's my privilege to um, uh, introduce her we all know uh, dr vasana is she is a Expertics at the law file, and um, she's uh, my best friend and uh, department mate. Uh, introducing her, so um, though she is a bit older than me, we were from '99 batch, and uh, so uh, and uh, she has been a brilliant student uh, during her undergraduate uh, period. and uh, she passed out as a, with a uh, second class honors with uh, with exceptional uh, uh, results in uh, surgery she had uh, um, a gold medal in uh, surgery though she did not take surgery but uh, let her husband select uh, surgery as a career so without much ado and people also have joined join in so uh, without taking your time fasana so let me uh, and we uh, according to you to conduct the lecture on uh, discussion on uh, childhood arthritis followed by mcqs okay. over to you thank you to shara for those words of introduction um, so first of all uh, i must uh, thank the president uh, and the council of, of for inviting me to do this presentation today um, and i think it's privilege and i take it as a great pleasure to uh, help our graduates in this way uh, so good evening to you all um, today um, i'm planning to discuss a common pediatric case a child with joint pains and afterwards uh, we'll do some mcq as well okay so give me a few seconds to open my presentation okay uh can you all uh, see my screen and hear me yes. you can see and hear you was na no? okay thank you okay right so uh the case i selected for discussion today is a child with joint pains so as you know uh, it's a common pediatric problem that you might come across in your day to day practice uh, and i this is the overview of today's present so uh, i will uh, go through the history and what i Uh, for you all to learn today is to have a child who presents with joint pains uh, in order to arrive at a reasonable differential diagnosis and by history and examination uh, to plan the evaluation of such a patient and to narrow down your differential diagnosis by doing the investigations and finally arriving at a most likely diagnosis for the patient and finally i will discuss principles of management um, related to the diagnosis of the case we are going to discuss today 
So once we uh, finish our case discussion, we'll move on to do some MCQs as well. Okay. So uh, this is how uh, the case discussion will go today. You are going to interact with me. First of all, I will give you um, the introduction of the parent uh, who is admitted to the, the basic information uh, of the patient given by the mother. And then I will give you two to three minutes to gather your thoughts and think of possibilities. What you are going to ask the mother um, to get more information so you can arrive at a differential diagnosis. Right, and uh, with that, we'll move on building up our case. Okay, right. So now I'm going to give you some information about this patient. So our patient today is a two-year-old boy who is admitted to the hospital. And the mother complains that the child fever for two weeks duration. And during the period, the child has been irritable and disliked being handled by parents. He also refused to walk. His appetite has been down. And towards the latter part of the illness, that is during the second week, mother noticed there is swelling of bilateral knee joints and bilateral and Okay, so this is the uh, initiation about the patient. I'll give about two to three minutes to count what is wrong with this patient, what could be the possibilities, and what other information will you need to arrive at a differential diagnosis. All right, so some of you may have already thought about the possibilities and maybe waiting to ask questions about this child. So I'll move on. Right, so you all can uh, unmute your audios and ask the questions from me so I can give you more information about this child. Okay, what else would you like to know in the history? Can somebody ask a question? Is there any rash? Okay, right, so very good. So this child had this rash, a transient pinking, pinkish skin rash, noted at the height of fever spikes. So I think you all can see that it's an erythematous macular papular skin rash. Did that have any GIT, any other infection? Not at the moment. The child is only having fever and these joint pains. Uh, there is no history of GI infection like diarrhea or vomiting. Okay. So all of you note down, right? So the positive negative findings that we are 
uh, revealing about this child so that you can formulate a differential diagnosis. Any other questions you would like to ask? Is the urine output normal? Uh, well, yeah, no concerns regarding the urine output. Um, no, mother remember any inspired. Okay, very good. You're asking very relevant. Uh, not migraine, uh, both knee joints swollen at the same time and the following day she noted swelling of the ankle joints but all four joints have been inflamed uh, at a given time. What I, what I mean is uh, when the ankle joints were seen swollen, the knee joints were still swollen and red. Any lymph node then? Yeah, we haven't come to the examination yet Puta. so we are still uh, talking about the history so we'll talk about does he complain of an abdominal pain um no abdominal pain does he have a significant weight loss present yeah mother thinks so Okay, right. right. So I think you all asked some reasonable questions, right? So now tell me what are the conditions that you all are thinking about as to the possibilities causing this fever and joint pain. Now there is multiple joint involvement. It can be inflammatory type arthritis, madam. Uh, like the okay, right. So you think, okay. Like what? JIA. Okay, right. So you think uh, that this could be an inflammatory condition. Like, okay. Anything else other than an inflammatory condition? Could this be anything else? It could be autoimmune. Can you give me an example? Rheumatic fever related. Okay, rheumatic fever. Right, very good. Okay, so we'll consider all these things and we'll try to rule out by examining this child and evaluation. Right, so rheumatic fever, fine. Anything else? That this Could be HSP. Okay, right, HSP. So it's a vasculitic condition. The reactive arthritis. Right, okay. Reactive arthritis. So can you tell me an example of reactive arthritis? Rater syndrome. Rater syndrome. So Rater syndrome is, uh, uh, is associated with GU infection, urinary infection, and medium and adult or uh, young adult type disease not very commonly seen in children but your are uh, due to various other organisms. Others think of the organisms that can cause reactive arthritis. Talk about it in a little Okay, any other cause that think of? Under malignancy is the possibility. Yeah, exactly, right. So any any that you think of, can you give an example? Um, like leukemia. Yeah, malignancy likely, acute lymphoblastic right? Very good. Okay, right. So we move on now. 
So uh, you are you are the case well, right? So now we are thinking of the possibilities, right? Of an Patriology, malignancy, or an autoimmune condition. Categories for possibility is present. Right? So now this history uh, spans, uh, uh, you know, course of a period. So that's quite a significant time. Okay? Right. So um, think of infection that can lead. What do you all think? Do you all like to consider Kawasaki disease? This is a two-year-old child. Possible or not? Possible. Okay, right. So it's all right to consider because this is a young child. And then you may exclude after taking further information about the history and also examination. Right. Okay, so uh, now we have thought of various possibilities. So we'll move on further in the history and try to make a differential diagnosis. Okay. Right, so if, if you take infections, as I mentioned, uh, post-infective phenomenon. So streptococcal infections are well known to cause uh, post-infective arthritis without causing rheumatic fever also, right? So rheumatic fever, again, is a post-streptococcal post phenomenon. Acute rheumatic fever can be complicated with carditis, right? But there are children who develop polyarthritis only, but they don't fulfill the criteria to diagnose rheumatic fever, right? But however, Rheumatic fever is more common in, you know, slightly old age group. Not common in the two-year-old child, isn't it? But any other streptococcal post-infective arthritis can occur at any age. Right? Okay, now somebody mentioned about reactive arthritis as well. Reactive arthritis, uh, typically, you know, by definition, it implies... Uh, you know, following gastrointestinal or genitourinary infections. Gastrointestinal infections caused by um, Shigella or uh, E. coli, um, Yersinia, Campylobacter-like organisms, they can cause a sterile inflammatory arthritis. So there is a bit of overlap between the post-infective and reactive arthritis. Um, so, uh, you know, don't worry too much about that when you, when you, uh, you know, sometimes when you call reactive arthritis, you really mean post-infective arthritis other than GI and GU infection. So that's fine as long as you consider a uh, primary infective etiology. So we have uh, uh, considered streptococcal infection here. Other than streptococci, many other organisms uh, viral infections, um, and uh, yeah, I have some, mentioned some of them here. Uh, Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, Coxsackievirus B, hepatitis B, like viruses, and also uh, uh, any other bacterial organism, even streptococcus pneumoniae, uh, you know, causing sepsis, uh, disseminated tuberculosis, cricket cell infections, mycoplasma, Lyme disease, there are so many infective etiologies which could result in sterile inflammatory arthritis, right? So in your history taking, you need to ask about recent infections, right? I'm happy that one uh, student asked about in recent insect bites, so I think he was thinking about the possibility of cell infection, right? You all asked about recent history of sore throat as well, gastrointestinal infections. So this is a very good analysis of the patient, right? Okay. Right. So taking the vasculitic con conditions into consideration, Kawasaki disease, right? So in your history, you need to ask more about uh, the clinical features of Kawasaki disease. Can, some, can you all mention what are the other features that you would like to know to see whether this fits into Kawasaki disease? 
features of conjunctivitis. Okay, right. Yeah, non parulent conjunctivitis. Extreme irritability may be there, right? Red tongue. Okay. So other features you establish by uh, examination. Right? Would you like to consider inflammatory bowel disease in this patient? Can inflammatory bowel disease present with arthritis? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, it can present. But then again, two years, the age of two years is not very common. Uh, not a very common age group to see um, uh, inflammatory bowel diseases, but still possible, right? So you have to keep everything in, in the back of your mind and try to exclude them. Okay, so uh, uh, somebody mentioned Henoxian line purpura as well. So what would you like to know to see whether this is Henoxian line purpura? The typical rash over the buttocks and explains the surfaces of lower limbs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there is a typical distribution of the HSP rash. So what I showed you is the trunk of the child. Um, and uh, uh, it's a erythematous macular papular rash, not really fitting into HSP rash. So you may examine and also you might ask about uh, a different rash in the child. But again... Uh, HSP is not very common in very young children, isn't it? It's more common in the preschool age group. Right? But that's all right. What other features may be there if it's HSP? Other than the rash, what other systemic manifestations may be there? Abdominal pain and vomiting. Man. Yeah, exactly. Abdominal pain uh, may be there and vomiting as well. Right. Good. Right, so we already, uh, you know, mentioned juvenile idiopathic arthritis, the systemic onset type. So you all know, uh, in systemic JIA, uh, they present with uh, on, uh, fever followed by polyarthritis, and they can have various systemic manifestations as well. Right? So you all revealed in the history that there is a rash, but we haven't examined this child to see whether other features are there. So what is juvenile dermatomyositis? What clinical features would be there apart from arthritis? Heliopic rash, got trend perfusion. Yeah, exactly. There is, it's a typical, uh, a typical uh, array of clinical features are there in juvenile dermatomyositis. So you can actually examine and find out. Okay, now although I have mentioned SLE here, it's not a condition that we uh, entertain in a two-year-old child. So if this child was more towards adolescence, we may have considered uh, SLE and other connective tissue disorders, right? Okay, now malignancies, uh, you all know ALL can present with joint manifestations. What else, what other clinical features, if they are there, will make it a more likely diagnosis. Patient is severely ill, madam. Yeah, child may be ill. Yeah. Any other manifestation? Thinking about the cell lines that are affected in AL. Madam, child may present with symptoms of anemia. Yes, uh, very good. Yeah. Even mother also might complain. Right. So considering other cell types, what are the bleeding main? manifestations, madam? Yeah, good bleeding manifestations like gum bleeding, right? Palatal. PTKI if when you examine, right? So uh, those uh, may be there, right? Good. And irritability may be due to bone pain also, isn't it? Right. Okay, neuroblastoma. What are the other manifestations of neuroblastoma? It's a bit difficult to say they may not have any, any other manifestation, but an older child may complain of backache 
right? So, but I don't think a two-year-old child can uh, complain. Uh, right. Okay. Good. Right. So now we have uh, considered various differential diagnoses. So according to your list, you all have considered systemic constant JIA, rheumatic fever, HSP, reactive arthritis, and acute lymphoblastic leukemia, right? So that's a reasonable list of differential diagnosis. But however, I think rheumatic fever we may not consider because this is a two-year-old child, a bit unlikely. Uh, right, okay. So we'll see what uh, other information do you need in the history? Like now we have talked about the presenting complaint. Anything else that you would like to know? I think we basically talked about this. We'll move on. Okay. So we'll move to the examination of this patient, right? So now considering the differential diagnosis you all considered, uh, tell me what are the features that you would like to find out in your general examination? Yeah, one student already uh, mentioned whether the child is ill or well. In the malignancy, he said the child will be very ill, right? Okay, so you have to see whether the child is ill or well, febrile or not. What else would you like to know? Pallor, lymphadenopathy. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Right, okay. So we'll see what this child had. So he was ill-looking, he was febrile. Now these are the findings on admission. He was irritable when handled, but he was not pale and not ectopic. Okay, so the rest of the investigations. He had lymphadenopathy, both cervical and axillary lymph node enlargement, significant lymph nodes measuring about, in the largest ones measuring about two centimeters. Others were shorty lymph nodes. There were no skin rashes at the time of examinations and there were no subcutaneous nodules. He was not edematous. He had swollen joints at both ankle, uh, knee joints, ankle joints, uh, right side wrist joint, and proximal interphalangeal joints. Okay. Mother didn't complain about the proximal interphalangeal joints, but on examination, uh, we could reveal that this child had uh, inflammation in these joints as well. He did have muscle tenderness and no bleeding manifestations as well, and no bone tendons. Okay, so these are the uh, findings of general examination. Right, so now you all note down the uh, important positive and negative findings in the examination. So that will help you to narrow down your differential diagnosis. Okay, so I'll move on to the systemic examination findings of this child. Right. So the cardiovascular system examination uh, revealed normal findings really and the auscultation was also normal. Respiratory system examination also did not reveal anything abnormal. Abdominal examination not distended. Uh, there was a mild generalized tenderness. Hepatomegaly, firm hepatomegaly of three centimeters, firm splenomegaly of two centimeters. So moderate hepatomegaly. The musculoskeletal system examination uh, mentioned with joints were involved. So all those swollen joints were red, warm, and tender. No neck or back pain or tenderness, so the axial skeletal not, skeleton not involved. No muscle wasting or tenderness. Sorry, there is a spelling mistake here. Okay. Neurological examination, central nervous system examination, 
was normal, conscious and alert child, and the cranial nerve examination was normal. Right. Okay, so these are the examination findings. Now, so here I summarize our patient. It's a two-year-old boy with two weeks history of fever, joint pains, and loss of appetite. Examination reveals an ill child with polyarthritis involving large and small joints, lymphadenopathy, and mild hepatosplenomegaly. So this is your patient now. Okay. Now that you all have the examination findings, I'm sure you all can uh, give uh, a more comprehensive differential diagnosis. Right. So can you all tell me now, uh, although you all mentioned uh, more possibilities previously, now I'm sure you all can narrow down your differential diagnosis to probably two, three or four maximum. Right. So what are the conditions you all would like to consider now? Systemic concept JIA. Okay, very good. Systemic concept JIA. What else? So that may be number one then, right? Okay. Yeah, come on. ALL, madam. Okay, very good. ALL, we haven't excluded clinically yet, right? Very good. Okay. Yeah. We'll take this slide again so that you all can think of your differential diagnosis out of these ones. So... So we are considering systemic concept juvenile idiopathic arthritis, ALL from this list. Any inflammatory condition that you all like to, post-infective condition that you all like to entertain? Could this still be a reactive arthritis? What do you all think? So can't this be a post-infective phenomenon? Can yeah, it still can. Yeah, it still can. Because uh, the, I mean, if you take the EBV infection, it causes a sterile inflammatory reaction. Uh, it can involve multiple joints and EBV infection can also cause lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, isn't it? Right? So those are still possible. Right. Okay, right, so let's see uh, what we could consider, right. So, as you all mentioned, uh, systemic concept JIA, ALL, uh, and even neuroblastoma is still possible until we uh, investigate, right. So, post-streptococcal arthritis, right, and even a viral etiology like EBV, cytomegalovirus, all, all those are possible, right. Now, we have basically excluded our previously considered few differential diagnoses like uh, HSP is now unlikely because we couldn't find any typical rash in this child. Uh, and rheumatic fever we excluded from the very beginning because of the age factor, right? Okay, now out of these, now we have to arrive at a differential, arrive at a most likely diagnosis by performing investigations on this child. Okay, so now we are moving on to the evaluation. Right. So what basic investigations would you perform? Now, can you all come out with the basic investigations? Um, 
and also we will discuss what we expect in them. Okay. Okay, right. Since we are running out of time, right, so we shall we be quick. Full blood, full blood count. count. Okay, excellent. Right. So everybody wants a full blood count. Right. So in these different the, the conditions that we have considered, we have considered actually four conditions. Right. Uh, so the count the count will be helpful, right? In uh, what do you expect in systemic JIA? Yeah, a neutrophil leukocyte, right? And also, you uh, a malignancy will also be evident in a full blood count, maybe a leukopenia or somebody's audio is sort of noise. Okay, that's better, right? So here I will show you some basic investigation results of this child. The total white cell count was 21,000 with 75% neutrophils. Hemoglobin was 9.5 grams per deciliter with platelets of 526,000. So CRP, 105 and ESR was 80, right? So we have done a blood picture on this child which showed normocytic normochromic anemia with reactive thrombocytosis and no abnormal cells. So the blood culture uh, did not show any growth. Right. Okay. So these are the basic investigations we have got. Now, how do you want, now uh, what uh, diagnosis could you exclude here? Is Systemic JIA is still possible? Yes, madam. Right, okay. So what about acute leukemia? Likely unlikely, acute... madam. Sorry? Unlikely, madam. They will have uh, unlikely, anemia. but do you still want to exclude by further evaluation? Yes. Hmm. Okay, right. Because there is a high ESR, maybe you still want to Think about a malignancy, right? Fine. Could this be post post streptococcal? Still possible or not? Unlikely. Yeah, a bit unlikely. Uh, yeah, but uh, maybe you, you can perform further investigations. What are the investigation that you could do to exclude streptococcal infection? A30. Yeah, exactly right. So we have done uh, some second line investigations next, right? So can you mention some second line investigations? Now, A30 that we talked about. Any other investigation that you would like to do next? Okay, right. So I think I'll move on. Right. So these are the other investigations, second line investigations we have performed. Ultrasound scan abdomen, which revealed Actually, it confirmed moderate hepatosplenomegaly with preserved hepatic architecture, no intra-abdominal lymphadenopathy or masses, right? So now not seeing an intra-abdominal mass, that, what could it exclude? So we particularly look at suprarenal masses, which could be suggestive of a neuroblastoma, right? But having said that, we can't exclude the neuroblastoma by just not visualizing a mass in the abdomen uh, because we can, uh, there could be masses elsewhere like paravertebral masses that we cannot visualize in an ultrasound scan, right? So therefore, we still can't exclude, right? Chest X-ray to look at mediastinal widening uh, caused by lymphadenopathy was not there, right? ASOT was negative, right? So it's a less than 200. We also performed EBV, cytomegalovirus, serology, which were negative. Uh, ANA rheumatoid factor were also negative. Eye assessment was done to detect anterior UV uveitis, which was also negative. And 2D echocardiogram did not reveal vegetations and no pericarditis. So why do we look at vegetations? Because I think you all remember in the previous slide, there are certain infections uh, that can uh, manifest with 
polyarthritis. So one is infective endocarditis, isn't it? And also generalized sepsis caused by, you know, like pneumococci uh, can cause polyarthritis. So in a very ill, febrile, septic looking child, you have to exclude these conditions as well, right? So we have done so. Why pericarditis? We wanted to exclude disseminated tuberculosis, which can involve uh, pericarditis, right? Okay, so Mantu was also done, which was negative. Right? Okay, right. So after seeing the second line investigations, now what do you think is more possible in this patient? Do you want to do any other investigation? Uh, Madam, aspiration of joint, joint aspiration fluid. Uh, okay, study. right. Joint aspiration can be done, but we haven't done in this patient. But actually, it's an investigation that you will uh, do. Right. Okay. What do you expect to see in joint aspiration? What, do you, what can you uh, confirm or exclude by doing a joint aspiration? Yes? J.I.E. Madam? Uh, they'll have a polymorphonucleosis uh, neutrophil. Uh, yes, yeah, you are correct. Yeah, in JIA, it will be a sterile inflammation. There will be a polymorphonucleosis infiltrate. And, uh, okay, uh, and uh, also in during the arthroscopy, you will be able to see the joint erosion, synovial uh, inflammation and all that, right? Okay. And all, uh, right, yeah. In a uh, single or like, you know, two joint involvement where you might consider septic arthritis, but we didn't consider septic arthritis in this patient, but I'm talking about a situation where there were uh, only a few joints were involved. You can actually exclude septic arthritis as well by doing a uh, arthroscopy and aspiration cytology. Right? Okay. Yeah. So joint aspiration can be helpful. Any other investigation that you would like to do? Bone marrow biopsy. Okay, fine. But in the bone marrow, uh, you could actually exclude the possibility of a malignancy, both ALL and neuroblastoma. Uh, the diagnosis could be established by a bone marrow biopsy, bone marrow aspiration. Right. So that we have done. We have also done a lymph node biopsy, which only showed reactive features. Bone marrow aspiration showed a reactive marrow with no features of a malignancy. Right? So, uh, in favor of a juvenile idiopathic arthritis, we have done a ferritin level, which was slightly elevated. Right? We have also done urinary VMA levels. Why do we do urinary VMA? Vanilyl mandelic acid. To exclude what condition? Neuroblastoma, right? Because neuroblastoma is a neural crest cell malignancy which secrete um, epinephrine, right? So VMA is a metabolite, right? So that we, for the diagnostic purpose, we do urinary VMA. And we also have done a CT scan abdomen. There were no suprarenal masses or paravertebral masses. This again, in view of excluding a neuroblastoma. Okay, right. So what is our diagnosis now? Right, so during the fourth week of illness, now this child underwent investigations over another fortnight. So at the end of four weeks, this is how the child was. Fourth week of fever, polyarthritis, erythematous rash with fever, lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, and on investigation, we have found neutrophil leukocytosis, elevated inflammatory markers, and we excluded infection and malignancy. Right. 
Okay, so I think the, uh, the uh, diagnosis is clear now. So we arrived at the diagnosis of systemic onset, juvenile idiopathic arthritis in this child. Okay, so systemic onset JIA is a diagnosis by exclusion. You highly suspect when there is a prolonged illness with fever and polyarthritis, right? But you have to exclude, uh, especially a malignancy in a child of two years, because ALL and neuroblastoma can mimic systemic onset JIA, right? And also the post-infective phenomena. So now you clearly saw how we excluded these conditions by history, examination, and investigations, right? So that is how you analyze a patient and arrive at a most likely diagnosis. Okay, so for systemic concept JIA, or um, at least there has to be two weeks of fever uh, with polyarthritis, right? And elevated inflammatory markers. Right? So all those are fulfilled in this patient. So before we talk a little bit about systemic concept JIA, do you have any questions with regard to uh, how we arrived at the diagnosis? All right. So this is not a presentation on juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Therefore, I'm not covering the entire JIA types. So I will just talk about this patient, right? So um, now systemic concept JIA, as you all know, is the chronic inflammatory disease with remissions and flare, right? So in, our, in the management of our patient, right? So it's important that we know this. So we need to induce a remission, right? and they maintain that. And we may, this child may present repeatedly with flare-ups as well. So that is the cause of the illness, right? So we should know about that. So this condition is characterized by, as I mentioned, polyarthritis. It's actually two weeks here, right? So it's not six, right? Two weeks, large and small joints. Yeah, polyarthritis of six weeks, sorry, the fever of more than two weeks rash, lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, and there will be evidence of serocytes. The commonest uh, type of serocytes we come across is pericarditis, right? Uh, and to arrive at a diagnosis, we need to exclude other treatable important conditions like infections and malignancies. So how did we manage this child? So I will go through uh, the principles of management you know, with regard to any patient with systemic concept JIA. Right. So the objectives of managing this patient would be to induce remission um, and then maintain the remission by uh, medical therapy and prevent the complications, the most common complication is the joint destruction. So we need to prevent joint destruction as much as possible while achieving a normal growth of the patient, right? And we have to minimize drug side effects because we have to use various toxic drugs in the management and finally improve the quality of life. So how are we going to achieve this? So, uh, induction of the remission. Uh, so there are various modalities in milder cases, in mild uh, systemic onset, onset JIA, uh, remission can be induced only with NSAID like ibuprofen or naproxen. But in moderate to severe cases, we need to induce remission with systemic steroids like either oral prednisolone or uh, intravenous methylprednisolone. In very severe cases, we can induce remission by using biological as well. We call this biological DMARDs. DMARDs are uh, disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. There are biological and non-biological ones. 
So anakindra is a biological demand, which is actually not available uh, for us at the moment. And so although, I mean, you may know about it, but uh, we cannot use it. It's not available. Right? Okay. So generally, uh, you will come across patients uh, in your clinicals. So systemic onset GIA in our setup, severe cases, we induce remission by using systemic steroids like methyl prednisolone. So uh, maintenance is usually in our setup is with methotrexate or leflunamide. Both of them are non-biological DMARDs. So you all know methotrexate, leflunamide, both these drugs have various side effects. They can be hepatotoxic, they can be toxic to the bone marrow. So we need to monitor these patients carefully. And we have to give a lot of supportive treatment by means of physiotherapy, occupational therapy, right, which, have, which are important in maintaining the muscle power and also stabilize the joints. Right? And also nutrition is an important entity in their management, uh, calcium supplements, because they are more prone for osteoporosis. Right? So vitamin D, all that have to be given. And then we need to monitor for complications, which are disease related as well as treatment related. Right? So these are the basic principles of management. Right. And at the same time, I would like to mention about this most dangerous complication of systemic JIA, which is macrophage activation syndrome or MAS. So it is characterized, characterized by falling blood counts. Now, while on treatment, the child may become very ill. Uh, the blood counts start dropping, even though, you know, platelet counts, the white cell count, and they develop a transaminitis characterized by elevated liver enzymes. Their ferritin levels shoot up, right? They, de they can develop coagulopathy and encephalopathy as well, right? So it's important that you monitor for this dangerous complication. So just to be aware of it, okay? Right, so let me now uh, summarize our case. Do you have any questions? Okay, now I mentioned about this biological, which is anakindra. It's an interleukin-1 receptor antagonist. But I don't know, although you all didn't ask, you may wonder, there are so many other biologicals. Why are we not talking about them? Right? So this is said to be the, uh, the best uh, by research, which has shown that it's the best uh, biological demand. Uh, but we have... Uh, other biological agents which, which are usually used in other types of uh, JIA like polyarticular type of JIA and oligoarticular type of JIA. So this is said to be the best one for systemic JIA. Right. Okay. Now let me summarize what we did in our case-based discussion today. So our patient was a two-year-old child with polyarthritis. And we considered all the age-related possibilities in our broad differential diagnosis, right? Although there are so many possibilities, you have to cater towards your patient, right? So you have to consider the age of the patient, sex of the patient, right? So many other, other things to consider what are the more likely conditions applicable to your patient, right? So we considered infections or the post-infective conditions, inflammatory malignancies, autoimmune and vasculitic conditions, right? And having considered all that, we went through the history examination and narrowed down our differential diagnosis. And then we embarked on the evaluation of the patient through which we excluded the important treatable conditions and then arrived at a, uh, the most likely diagnosis, right? So this is what you have to do in all the complex clinical problems, right? Okay, so we conclude our case-based discussion here.
If you have any questions, you can ask me now before we move on to the MCQ discussion. Okay, so no questions? Right. So uh, I think I have about 12 questions for y'all today. Uh, we'll start with some SBS. So I have selected some uh, Questions related to the central, uh, cardiovascular system and gastrointestinal system today, right? So not a big variety. Okay, right. So the first question, it's a 10-month-old baby who was brought in by parents due to poor feeding and excessive crying for six hours, was diagnosed to have supraventricular tachycardia on ECG. Sinus rhythm could not be restored with an ice bag applied on the face. Peripheral pulses are not felt and capillary refill time is more than three seconds. What is the most suitable action to be taken next? Okay, right. So what do you all think? I do not see. Okay. See, right. Very good. Any other answer? Synchronized cardio version as the child is in shock. Okay. Very good. Right. Okay, right. So how do you handle this case? So can you all see this tracing, ECG tracing? So this is a typical supraventricular tachycardia where you cannot identify the P waves. The heart rate is more than 200. Right? In fact, you may see inverted P waves in the lead two. Right? So if we go through the algorithm, right? so it all depends on whether your patient is in shock or not. Right? So this is the first thing you consider, shock present or not. If there is no shock, you start with your vagal maneuvers, right? Okay. So if you go to our case, now this child was diagnosed with a supraventricular tachycardia and first the vagal maneuvers have been tried. So I, applying ice bag uh, is the, uh, the most common vagal maneuver we uh, try on infants, right? We do not do carotid massage in young infants because one thing is it's difficult to palpate the carotid because they have very short necks, right? Uh, and ice, application of ice bag is more effective, right? Now, uh, so this baby has been in SVT for some time because the vagal maneuvers have been tried and then the peripheral pulses were not felt, right? So this child is in shock. So if a child is in shock, right? Uh, so the best management is synchronized DC cardioversion. But however, if there is a cannula and it's uh, the arranging the cardioversion is getting delayed, you can try adenosine, right? But the best thing is synchronized cardioversion. So the answer would be synchronized cardioversion here. Uh, and if you just, you know, for your, the sake of discussion, if we go through the, uh, uh, the vagal pathway, the child is not in shock. You try a vagal maneuver first, failing which you give adenosine. Okay? 
So we can escalate the doses of adicine. You can give up to two to three doses even. Uh, and then uh, you also can try amiodarone. If there is no response to adenosine, again, the option is synchronized cardioversion. Okay, right. So the answer is D here. So the most suitable would be cardioversion. Now, if you go through all these responses, all are quite correct, right? So unilateral carotid passage is correct, but it's not the best thing for a 10-month-old baby. Right? And intravenous adenosine is also correct, but the best would be the DC cardioversion. Right? Intravenous amiodarone, that is also correct. Right? Bolus of 0.9 saline because Jai is in shock, that is also correct. Right? So, so this is how the um, single best answers come because all the responses have something true about them, but <coughs> There will be only one which is the best fit. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Right. So I didn't give you a question time. Any questions? So is it clear now? So we'll move on. Right. Nine-year-old girl with tetralogy of fellow. Presents with low-grade fever of two weeks and severe headache of three weeks. The most likely diagnosis is. Yes. What do you all think? Cerebral abscess B. Okay, cerebral abscess, right? Any other answer? Okay, anybody think differently? Okay, right. So what do you think about acute frontal sinusitis? So this is also possible, isn't it? But, um, but however, with the given history, you have to relate the condition to the pre-existing condition. Right? So, and also frontal sinus is not very well developed in a nine-year-old child. So although this could be correct, this may not be the best one, right? So cerebral abscess. So you all thought about cerebral abscess, right? So in a child with tetralogy of fallow, it's a cyanotic heart disease and there is a ventricular septal defect. So it's a mixing lesion. So children are more susceptible to develop cerebral abscesses. And this could be the presentation of a cerebral abscess. So this is quite true, right? So what about cerebral venous thrombosis? Can't it be true? Possible or not? Possible. Yeah, it is possible. It is possible. Cerebral venous thrombosis also could present having mild fever, right? Uh, um, and they have uh, severe headache, but in addition to severe headache, they may show deterioration in the level of consciousness. They may throw convulsions. Even cerebral abscesses can throw convulsions, right? So this is also possible. What about infective endocarditis? There is fever. There is history of tetralogy of fallow, which makes a child susceptible to develop infective endocarditis, right? So this is also possible, but still the headache doesn't 
quite uh, tally with the infective endocarditis. Right? Therefore, it is less possible. TB meningitis, right? that is also possible, isn't it? Uh, uh, these children are immunocompromised, so they can develop infections. So TB meningitis is possible, but however, out of all this, considering the diagnosis of cyanotic heart disease and the fever and headache, cerebral abscess is the most likely diagnosis, right? So B is the correct answer. Any questions about this? Any doubts? Okay, right. So I hear a discussion going on whether it's a high grade fever or a low grade fever. Right? Um, if this stem said there is high grade fever of, uh, it can't go on for two weeks, no high grade fever of say four to five days then still cerebral abscess would be the most likely diagnosis. But however, um, uh, low-grade fever is also a kind of presentation in cerebral abscess. You can't exclude if there is uh, no swinging fevers, right? Because sometimes these abscesses are caused by less virulent organisms in these children, unlike in uh, cerebral abscesses due to pneumococci and staph aureus in an otherwise well child uh, in tetralogy of fellow because of their immunocompromised situation they can develop infections due to less virulent organisms which may not cause very high fevers right okay did i make things clear Firstly, a healthy 11-year-old girl developed cramping abdominal pain with watery stools. One week later, she presents with bloody stools and reduced urine output. Her blood pressure is 120 by 90 mercury millimeters. Full blood count revealed a hemoglobin level of 6.5 grams per deciliter and a platelet count of 110,000. The most appropriate investigation to perform next is. Okay, what do you all think? What is this scenario? What is this condition? Okay, right. Good. Right. So what investigation would you perform next to confirm that now you clinically suspect hemolytic uremic syndrome? Which investigation out of, you may do, do most of these, right? You may do most of them, but which investigation would you give more information to support your diagnosis here? Because to do any intervention or to treat, first you need to see whether your thinking is correct, isn't it? Blood picture, madam. Okay, right, yeah, blood picture. Any, anything else that you are thinking of? Okay, right. So hemolytic uremic syndrome, this is a diarrhea associated HUS, right? So it's what is the, what are the organisms that cause HUS? Yeah, it's I didn't hear properly. Did I hear Ashigella? 
it's usually caused by shigella, uh, the verotoxin or the shiga toxin producing E. coli or shigella dysentery, right? Those are the GI infections that can cause HUS, but HUS can be caused by other organisms uh, as well. For example, uh, pneumococci, right? So new remedies producing pneumococci can also lead to HUS, but here there's a clear history of GI infection, right? So it's most likely produced by uh, shiga toxin producing E. coli or shigella. Okay, so what happens is this is a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia uh, where it causes anemia, thrombocytopenia, elevated liver functions, acute kidney injury, hypertension, encephalopathy, and so on, isn't it? And jaundice also, right? So you all mentioned blood picture, which is actually the correct answer. Uh, so what would the blood picture show here? How will it support your diagnosis? It will show features of microangiopathic hemolysis characterized by what? What are the features? What is the classic feature of the red cell? Have you all heard of fragmented red cells, Burr cells? Yes, yes sir. Yes. Ah, right. Yeah, so blood picture is going to be quite helpful to you. So you establish the diagnosis, right? You may also do a sound scan abdomen. You will do the renal function test because this child is, you see, or rigori, yeah. There is reduced urine output. So he, the child may be heading towards AKI, right? So you will have to do all that, right? But obviously you may not do a stool calprotectin level because there's enough information to suggest HUS, right? So blood picture is the correct answer. Okay, so shall I move on? Do you have any questions? Okay, right. So a 12-year-old boy presented with recurrent abdominal pain of two years and intermittent diarrhea and oral ulcers. He is thin with a height plotting at the third centile. However, his height has been on the 25th centile two years back. Abdominal examination revealed mild tenderness and two perianal fissures were noted. So you are given some investigations here. White cell count 11,000 with 54% neutrophils, hemoglobin 8, platelets 540,000, ESR 65, see the CRP of 45, and serum albumin 29. The most likely diagnosis is... What do you all think? Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease. Okay. Right. Anything else? Okay. Right. So what are the cardinal features? Right. So there is a recurrent abdominal pain of two years, intermittent diarrhea, oral ulcers is there, right? What else? There are perianal fissures and platelets, right? So these are the clues to your diagnosis. So I agree with the response of Crohn's disease, right? So these are the typical manifestations of Crohn's disease. But however, all the other responses also indicate chronic GI conditions, right? So intestinal TB can also present with, uh, these features. Right? However, chronic giardiasis, it can cause chronic diarrhea, but however, you don't see any systemic responses, isn't it? 
uh, you don't expect elevated inflammatory markers and all that. So it's unlikely. So Crohn's disease, there are a lot of supportive information. Entire GI tract is involved uh, and uh, the inflam inflammatory features are there in the blood investigations. So why is ulcerative colitis less likely here? Because of the oral ulcers, right? Uh, okay, so the generally the history is more supportive of a Crohn's disease, right? Intestinal lymphoma again can present and the high platelets are a bit. Uh, so any questions about this? Okay, right. So shall we move on? Now, um, true false type questions. Pulmonary stenosis is known to be associated with. Okay, now this is a true false type, right? So you have to tell me uh, the correct So it's a condition associated with pulmonary stenosis, right? Okay, so I mean, these type of questions, either you know, you don't know, right? So uh, when, you all, when you all do the MCQs, you, you all will come across these things and then you can, uh, you know, keep those things in mind. So those who don't know, uh, uh, right, so just... You can learn even now. Noonan syndrome is a condition where uh, it's associated with pulmonary stenosis. Now, the similar uh, uh, syndrome to Noonan is Turner syndrome, where you find mainly left-sided problems, bicuspid aortic valve and coarctation of aorta. Okay. So, tetralogy of fellow, you all know, pulmonary stenosis is a component of it, but actually it's not only pulmonary stenosis, it's uh, entire, uh, the outflow tract is stenosed. But however, pulmonary stenosis is part of it. Right? So that's correct. Rheumatic fever in acute rheumatic valvulitis, pulmonary valve can also get involved. So it can occur in rheumatic fever, but it's rather rare for the pulmonary valve to get involved, right? But uh, it's possible. Transposition of great arteries is a pulmonary stenosis. No, madam. Yeah, there is no pulmonary stenosis, right? So the great arteries are transposed uh, and uh, there is nothing like pulmonary stenosis there. Williams syndrome, it's known to be associated with pulmonary stenosis, right? So this is a condition with high, hypercalcemia. Uh, pulmonary stenosis and aortic stenosis, both supravalve aortic stenosis. Right. Okay. So there is nothing clinical in this uh, topic. So you all have to study and know these facts. Okay. So now uh, I think you all can 
uh, find out what are the causes of, you know, the associations of aortic stenosis, for an example, right? um, conditions associated with um, like, you know, any other cardiac conditions like, say, PDA, right? things like that, or VSD. So we'll move on. So the only wrong answer here is transposition of great arteries. Disorders associated with complete heart block include. So you all can tell me the correct responses. A is correct, madam. Okay, A is correct, right? What else? Okay, I have got in the chat box, uh, I think it is for this one, true, 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 false. Okay, right, so A is correct. You all know that maternal SLE is associated with the complete heart block in the infant. Acute rheumatic fever, yeah, that's correct. It can lead to varying degrees of all types of heart block can occur in acute rheumatic fever. Chronic rheumatic valvulitis, generally, it doesn't cause any uh, complete heart block, right? But it can lead to uh, various uh, you know, fibrillations and so on, arrhythmias, but not complete heart block. Cardiac rhabdomyoma, yeah, it's a cause of complete heart block, right? So. But uh, do you all know any condition with, that is associated with cardiac rhabdomyoma? Have you all heard of tuberous sclerosis? It's a neurocutaneous condition that affects infants. Those, those children can have rhabdomyoma. I mean, not only uh, tuberous sclerosis in any, any other child. It's a cause of complete heart block. And why infectious mononucleosis? It can cause myocarditis, right? So any infection that leads to myocarditis can lead to complete heart block, right? So the only wrong answer here is chronic rheumatic valvulitis. Okay, right. So find more uh, conditions that can cause complete heart block. Okay, any questions? Management of hypocyanotic spell uh, in an 18-month-old child includes Okay, so we'll move on. Uh, keeping in Nietzsche's position, correct or not? Correct, man. Yeah, it's correct. So that is the, uh, the most important maneuver one has to do. Either a parent or the caregiver or even when they come to the hospital. That is what we do. Keeping in Nietzsche's position. Right? Administration of oxygen. So it's correct. It's very obvious. Fluid restriction. Correct or not? Correct, well. Okay, why fluid restriction? Right, okay, we'll come to that. Commence adrenaline infusion. It's not correct, right? Administration of intravenous morphine. Correct, well. It's correct, right. So what do we do when a child presents with hypersynotic spell? Right? So first thing is to put the child in DHS position, then you start oxygen get an IV cannula in, right? 
and you have to give a fluid bolus to this child to improve the venous return, uh, to improve the cardiac output, and you have to give intravenous morphine that helps relaxation of the infundibular spasm that has occurred, and intravenous propanolol. Right? Either intravenous propanolol or if it's not available, we have to put an NG tube down and give oral propanolol even. Right? Okay. So that's how you manage a hypocyanotic spell. Right? Any questions? So this is a straightforward question. It's a cardiac emergency. There is no place for adrenaline infusion because, uh, in, uh, in hypersynotic spells. Okay. Right. So we'll move to the next question. I have something in the chat box. Let me check. A and B. Clinical features of a patent ductus sartoriosus in a six-month-old infant. What do you all think? Central cyanosis? No, madam. No, right. Poor weight gain? True, madam. Can. Okay. Continuous murmur? True, madam. Yeah, it's true. It's obvious. Blood pressure of 100 by 80 millimeters mercury? And parasternal heap. Okay, right. So, uh, central cyanosis, you know, we are talking about a six-month-old infant, right? Okay. So, I will, uh, I will show you the hemodynamics of PDA, right? So, then that will be right. Okay. So, this is what happens in the PDA. There is a connection between the pulmonary uh, artery and the aorta. So, uh, after birth, uh, the left ventricular pressure increases. So the flow reverses, right? And the, uh, with the ventricular contraction, uh, some of the aortic blood will go through this ductus into the pulmonary artery, right? So that explains the continuous, continuous murmur because throughout the cardiac cycle, aortic pressure is higher than the pulmonary pressure, right? So therefore, there is a continuous flow through systole, diastole, both, giving rise to a continuous murmur. And uh, can it cause cyanosis? It can't cause cyanosis because the systemic perfusion, systemic oxygenation occurs normally because there is only a little bit of blood that is diverting here. But with time, what happens when uh, if a PDA is not corrected and the child grows up, um, the it can give rise to pulmonary hypertension. The, there is consistently increased pulmonary blood flow, then it can uh, give rise to pulmonary hypertension. And later on, a child can develop Eisenmenger syndrome and uh, right heart failure, right? So that happens later on, not in a six-month-old baby. Right? So there is, there is increased right ventricular blood flow, right? So which can cause congestion on the right side and uh, cause right heart failure. So now having uh, seen this hemodynamics, can you select the answers here? So central cyanosis is unlikely in a six-month-old baby. Poor weight gain is common uh, because there is the hyperdynamic circulation, increased basal metabolic rate. Right? Continuous murmur is well explained. Blood pressure 100 by 80, it's not correct because you, you expect a wide pulse pressure because there is diversion of aortic blood. 
So in diastole, the pressure drops, right? And parasternal heave is explained by increased right ventricular pressure, right? Okay. So uh, centrosinosis is false and this normal blood pressure is also false. Any questions? So very silent. Are you all tired? Or enough? Tell no me. Idea. Okay, if you can't concentrate, tell me we can stop. Okay, right. So one more question. Intermittent chest pain in a 10-year-old child is suggestive of cardiac origin in the presence of When would you think of a cardiac origin in a child with chest pain? Okay, precordial tenderness, true false. False. Okay. Association with uh, with physical exertion. True. True. Okay. Frontal headache. Chest pain and frontal headache. Could it be cardiac origin? Deterioration in school performance. True. Man. Okay. Bilateral calf pain on exercise. Roman. Right, okay, we'll go through. Now, intermittent chest pain in a 10-year-old child is suggestive of a cardiac origin. So, we have to be quite specific here, right? So, chest pain is, can be common in a 10-year-old child and it can occur due to various reasons, isn't it? So if there is precordial tenderness, it's more suggestive of a musculoskeletal origin like uh, perichondritis or what do you call that? Uh, costochondritis, isn't it? Something like that. So it's, it doesn't really indicate a cardiac origin. So that's false. Association with, it, with physical exertion, then it's significant, right? It may be cardiac, it may be respiratory or anything else, but if it is associated with physical exertion, you have to exclude the cardiac problem, right? Chest pain coming on with physical exertion, right? Frontal headache and chest pain. In a child with chest pain, I mean, if frontal headache is mostly due to either migraine or tension type headache, right? So it doesn't really indicate that chest pain is of cardiac origin. Okay, deterioration of school performance cannot relate to cardiac origin, right? Okay, so all these could be psychosocial. So bilateral calf pain, bilateral calf pain, chest pain, very relatable because this could be indicating tension of aorta. Okay. So the cardiac uh, causes at this age to cause chest pain are mostly uh, aortic, mild aortic stenosis or bicuspid aortic uh, valve causing uh, stenosis later on and also coact undetected coarctation of aorta. Right? So those are the conditions that give rise to uh, cardiac origin chest pain. Uh, you know, if there are other features like intermittent claudication to exclude, exclude this underlying cardiac lesions. Okay. If you have any questions, you can ask me. Right. Okay. Recurrent abdominal pain is a feature in the following conditions. Hereditary angioedema, chronic constipation, 
connection line purpura, pinworm infestation, and cystic fibrosis. Okay, but you really enjoy edema. So I want some responses. I mean, you, you don't, don't just wait for me to talk through. No, madam. True, false, I didn't hear clearly. True, madam. True, right, okay. I'm only hearing one or two voices. Where are the others? Chronic constipation? True, madam. True, True madam. Okay, very good. Yeah. Uh, Henoxian line purpura? True, madam. True, very good. Pinworm infestation? Cystic fibrosis? Madam. Okay, right. So we'll go through. Hereditary angioedema? Uh, it's a no well-known condition. It can present with recurrent abdominal pain because of the uh, intestinal wall edema and ischemia. Okay, chronic constipation. It's very easy. It causes recurrent abdominal pain and henoxian line purpura. Can it cause recurrent abdominal pain? No, it's an acute condition, isn't it? When a child has HSP, he will have abdominal pain, but it can't cause recurrent abdominal lysed infection. It's not a cause of abdominal pain, right? Cystic fibrosis, what do you all think? What does it cause to the intestines? Not to the intestines, to the abdomen. Chronic pancreatitis. See it? Exactly, it can cause pancreatitis, right? So, it, so it's a cause of recurrent abdominal pain, right? So only HSP and pinworm infestation are wrong. So I think it's quite easy. Oh, it has answers also. Never mind. So her sprung disease uh, has a marked male predominance. I have, I have forgotten to uh, hide the answers here. <laughs> right. It's unlikely if meconium has passed within the first 24 hours. Right? So you all know that. No? So if a, if a newborn infant does not pass meconium within the first 24 hours, you, you worry. right? You have to think whether this could be Hirschsprung's disease. Or, I mean, before that, you think of um, imperforate anus. Has a higher incidence in Turner syndrome. There is no such thing, but it's more commonly seen in trisomy 21. Empty rectum is a common clinical finding. Right? So that is actually the typical finding in PR examination, empty rectum. Right? So I will show you a diagram to say why. Rectal biopsy is a useful investigation. Yeah, we diagnose by doing a rectal biopsy. So... This is what happens in her Sprung's disease. There is an aganglionic segment here. So it's contracted. So the rectum is empty. And just uh, proximal to that, there is marked dilatation. Gastroesophageal reflux. So I'm talking about the infants with gastroesophageal reflux here. It's a recognized cause of projectile vomiting. It's a cause of aspiration pneumonia. It's treated with prokinetic agents. It's caused by antiperistaltic activity of the stomach. Has a higher incidence among uh, children with cerebral palsy.
Yeah. What do you think? First one is false, second is uh, true. First one is false, second uh, B is true. What about C? D? False. D false, madam. B false. E has a higher incidence among children with cerebral palsy. True. Okay, right, very good. Right, so GORD is a recognized cause of projectile vomiting. It's not, isn't it? It only causes positive, right? Uh, so projectile vomiting is a feature of pyloric stenosis, isn't it? In an infant. Right. Okay, so this is wrong. It's a cause of aspiration pneumonia. It's correct. So that's what we always talk about. That's why we treat GORD because there is a risk of aspiration. Is treated with prokinetic agents, yes, because that strengthens the loesophageal sphincter. Is caused by antiperistaltic activity of the stomach. You all said it's false. Yeah, it's false because this is not the explanation for GORD. GORD occurs because of the dysfunction of the loesophageal sphincter. Right? Has a higher, this happens in pyloric stenosis, right? Has a higher incidence among children with cerebral palsy. Yeah, that's correct. Not only cerebral palsy, in a lot of physically handicapped children, GORD is a problem. Right? Okay, so the answers would be, first one is false, second is true, C and D are false. So I think this is true, isn't it? Maybe a mistake here. Yeah, so this has to be true. And uh, yeah, the last one is also true. Yeah. Okay, so this is a mistake here, right? Causes of blood and mucus stools include causes of blood and mucus in stools. What about giardiasis? True, false? True. true. Okay. False. False. Yeah, giardiasis does not cause, yeah, it's just a watery diary. I think you all got confused with amoebiasis. Amoebiasis causes, and also what is this, balantidiasis or something, both of them causes blood and mucus stools, but not giardiasis. It's, a typ it's typically a watery diarrhea. Shigellosis? Too much. True. True. Yeah. Intersusception? Too much. Yeah, that's also true because it, it's not true blood and mucus, but it's red current jelly, but uh, it has blood and mucus both. Anal fissure? It's false, isn't it? It doesn't cause blood and mucus in stools, so it can cause blood uh, surfacing the stools, right? So there is no blood and mucus. So chronic constipation? That's also false, right? So it's obvious. Okay, this is the last one, the one before. Intestinal villus atrophy is seen. This is a common name, CQ, actually. You all may have come across this one earlier. Chronic amoebiasis. True, madam. Chronic amoebiasis. Oh, it's false because amoebiasis is a colonic infection, right? So the villi are there in the small intestine, so it doesn't affect, right? Cow's milk protein allergy? Oh, true, madam. Yeah, it causes. Yeah, if you don't know, it's true because most immunodeficiencies cause intestinal villus atrophies, right? Okay. Koshyoko? True, yeah, it's true, it's true, right? So severe malnutrition causes intestinal villus atrophy. Gluten sensitive enteropathy, this is celiac disease. True, madam. True, madam. That's also true, right, okay. 
So amoebiasis is the only false one. Right, so we come to the last question. Hypertrophic pyloric stenosis is likely in a six-week-old infant with projectile vomiting in the presence of, right, so we are asking for the other features here. Distended upper abdomen, jaundice, bilious vomiting, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis, hepatomegaly. Distended upper abdomen, true or false? True, madam? Mm. It's true because the stomach is distended. It appears as distended upper abdomen. So that's true. John, this? John, this is not a typical feature of pyloric stenosis. It may or may not be there, but there is no connection with pyloric stenosis, right? Bilious vomiting? False, madam. False, madam. False, yeah. Yeah, so there shouldn't be bilious vomiting. There's bilious vomiting, you have to think of uh, obstruction down below the pyloric level, right? So that's wrong. Hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis? True, true madam. madam. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's what you expect because uh, HCL is lost in the vomitus. You expect hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis, right? Hepatomegaly? That's false. There is no relationship with hepatomegaly. Right? Okay. Yeah, that's it. So we have come to the end of our question discussion. Right. So do you have any questions, any clarifications you want before I stop sharing now? So I see some responses in the chat box as well. Madam, in this MCQ, uh, yeah. shouldn't, shouldn't there be jaundice because uh, the baby cannot be breastfed? Did the breastfeeding jaundice shouldn't it occur? It may occur, but it doesn't uh, uh, help in the diagnosis. It may be there. Uh, now, the question asks, hypertrophic pyloristenosis is likely in a six-week-old infant with projectile vomiting in the presence of. So, the responses should directly link with the uh, projectile vomiting. So, now, our patient has projectile vomiting. What are the other features? If they are there, satisfy the diagnosis of pyloric stenosis. Jaundice could be an association, right? But it doesn't indicate, it doesn't... Uh, directly relate with the um, pyloric stenosis, right? Jaundice may or may not be there. Yeah, so it's a good question. Thank you. In addition, there could be a weight loss in the child, poor weight gain. Actually, there will be dehydration and weight loss. Okay, good. Any other questions? Okay, I think we are close to 10 o'clock. Yeah. yeah, I think we can uh, call Dane Dawson. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I uh, on behalf of the, the, all the students, I want to thank you, madam, for this wonderful session on childhood arthritis. Uh, it, is, uh, it was very engaging and uh, enjoyable. We know uh, that you have a busy schedule and to spare us your valuable time, in something uh, we are truly grateful for madam thank you very much madam i also want to thank you femsa for organize uh, this opportunity for us thank you very okay. much okay thank you it's my pleasure